It's often said that batteries are at the heart of the energy transition, and the innovation in this particular space is really quite breathtaking to behold. Uh, but there's another uh, innovation that came out of the uh, University of British Columbia recently, a wearable and bendable battery. And you can even put it in the, wash it in the washing machine. And I'm going to talk to Dr. John Madden, who's the director of UBC's Advanced Materials and Process Engineering Lab about it. Welcome to the interview, John. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Now, on the one hand, this is the coolest thing ever, you, a, a battery you can stretch. Now I'm having trouble imagining that, but that, but the other, but what are the applications for this? Well, imagine you want to monitor somebody's health. Maybe you want to do something basic like their heart rate or their, uh, how often they breathe, or maybe you want to do something more sophisticated. Like you want to measure the, their sweat and see how much blood sugar there is in it, or you want to see whether they are, at risk of a certain disease. Then uh, the challenge now is there are sensors that can do these things, but they need power. And power comes as we know in these hard batteries. And people don't like to wear that and they don't like to stick it in, uh, they're, they're not good in the washing machine. And number three, not all of them are safe to have next to the body. Sure, lithium ion can be, can be a problem if it, if it breaks down. So it, 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 describe how, what, how, what this looks like. And I understand it's in the, the, uh, the battery materials are embedded in polymer? Yes, so what our innovation is, is that the entire battery contains a stretchable elastomer. So a, a plastic that is stretchable and recoverable, similar to rubber, and it's in all the layers. The challenge with making something out of rubber is that rubber itself and most other stretchable plastics let water and other liquids through very easily and gases. And so your battery dries out in no time, uh, things get into it that you don't want in there. And so it's not good, especially for technology like lithium. So what we did was combine two things. One, find a rubbery material, which is called SIBs, that is very water impermeable. It still lets some out, but very little. So. You know how in a, in a, when you go to the, the store and you buy something in plastic packaging, often it has a thin layer of metal inside to stop the exchange of gases and so on. That's because plastics in general are not good at holding things out. We've found one that is quite good. And so we have a battery that can now last at least a couple of years without drying out too much. The second part is we want it to be stretchable not just bendable, but also stretchable. There are quite a few bendable batteries and those are really exciting. But if you sit on something that's bendable and, and it bends in more than one direction, it's not gonna be comfortable. So we wanted it to be stretchable as well. And so that part we have as well. And then we need it to stick together. So that means we need to have all the layers be stretchable, including, uh, and the cell that we're using has zinc and manganese dioxide, both hard, stiff materials. So we have to grind them into a powder, mix them with this plastic, and then we can get it to all stretch. And then we also need the liquid part to be in a stretchable and, and it all sticks together. So. Well, help me out here, because when I think of a battery, like, you know, something in an electric vehicle, for instance, you've got an anode, you've got a cathode, you've got electrolyte, you've got some separators, and that all makes sense to me. I can imagine the mechanics of that. I'm having trouble imagining how those components fit into once they're all crushed down and embedded in your, in your polymer. Yeah, so basically what we do is we lay out each layer at a time. So the same, we have all the same layers that you just talked about. Uh, so if we think of a conventional battery, there's a hard metal coating on the outside, right? Instead of that, what we have is something that's stretchable. So a, a, a rubbery layer, we lay that out. Then we spread on top of that, the next layer, which is the layer that makes electrical contact. And that layer has uh, carbon in it to give it conductivity, just like a car tire, but even higher uh, proportion so that it becomes really a good conductor. Sometimes we also add metals there to make it even more conductive. Then we spread out on that a thin layer of either the zinc or the manganese dioxide, which by the way, are the same components that you find in your conventional alkaline battery. The difference being that this one's rechargeable unlike your home alkaline battery. So we lay that out. Well, first we mix it up with 
with this SIBs and with some conducting material, some conductive carbon, we lay that out in a thin layer. Then the trickiest layer is the separator layer that you were talking about. So that contains the electrolyte, it makes ionic contact, but of course we don't want electronic contact. So there we use again the same polymer, but we make it porous. So it has holes in it. We put that down, we put the other three layers for the other side, uh, we seal it most, mostly around, we inject it with a needle full of the electrolyte and then do a final seal and it's like a pouch ready to go. And I can show you one in a minute. We can walk over and have a look at these things. Well, that's okay. I, I think your uh, PR, your comms folks have kindly provided a little video. So I think we're yep. okay there. Uh, <laughs> but I understand that this one has been tested already 39 times through the, the wash cycle and nary a leak. Yes, well, actually after those 39 cycles, the point that we, uh, that we sealed, did this final seal, did rupture. So it's not perfect, but we're pretty sure we know what to do now. Um, that's the weak point, and we can, we can fix that by uh, changing the way we bond it. So what's the next uh, stage here, John? Like, uh, do you, uh, what, what do you have to do now to take this to a pilot stage, demonstration stage, commercial stage? Where, where do you go from here? So we're already working with a couple of partners, one big uh, uh, clothing manufacturer and one small company that make medical devices uh, to send them samples and see how they work. One of the challenges already is that the power is a bit low. So uh, as, as many of us know with Bluetooth, it, Bluetooth, even low power, low energy Bluetooth takes quite a bit of power. So we need to put in some milliamps of current. And so that it, we're sort of at the limit of just being able to drive Bluetooth and we can't do it for a really long time. So one of the reasons, one of the things that's limiting us is how conductive our stretchable layers are. So how much current we can get in and out. So now we're experimenting with more conductive layers by adding metal and other materials. And so that's looking promising. And so I think, I think we're close to we can, we can now do, uh, run Bluetooth for short periods of time. And the next stage is to run it over hours, which I think we can do, but still have to demonstrate. And I, I understand that one of the features of uh, your technology is that it's actually fairly cost-effective. It's, uh, it's, it's not expensive. Yeah, we're talking about uh, the same materials, as I said, that are used in alkaline cells. So. Now, of course, if we're just making a few, that's gonna be expensive. But if these end up being a standard, then we're talking about a technology that the, for the materials, they're more than 10 times cheaper than lithium ion uh, for, the same, for the active materials. So in principle, it can be very inexpensive. So if you were so, like a, a diabetic, I've seen this, the, the, the diabetic devices where they attach them to their arm, and so I assume that that would be an application. What might a battery cost you, guess, uh, $10, $20, something like that? I'm thinking even uh, you know, a couple of dollars, depending on how long you need it to last, um, how much, whether you need it to run a motor or whether it's just a matter of running a, a, you know, a low power sensor. But, yeah. And what about, we hear a lot about uh, the circular economy in connection to batteries. Uh, will this device be recyclable or, uh, you know, so that it, it, its components can be reused in battery and uh, further battery production? The active materials here are the same as uh, in alkaline. Um, so there's zinc and manganese dioxide. Already there's a they're very good recyclability of those materials. So I don't see a big problem. We do have to figure out though, now that we've ground them up and mixed them with other materials, how easy is that gonna to be to do the recycling? So that I don't know the answer. And uh, how does the, uh, walk me through how this gets into the marketplace. Uh, has, uh, has UBC spun off a, a, spun off a startup company? Uh, who owns the patents? Uh, if you don't mind sharing that. Then yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, UBC owns the patent on this. Uh, we are in discussion with a couple of potential uh, partners, but they're more on the application side. So we need somebody to make these if they work out. So 
once we've shown that, okay, they're promising to make, uh, we actually have uh, some of our internal team members who are then looking to start up a company around this, but we'd also be open to, you know, working with other, uh, other partners who might be interested. Well, look, this is fascinating and, and kudos to you and your team for, for, uh, you know, such an innovative uh, product. I, uh, I mean, I can't wait until uh, my pacemaker uh, gets to run up. <laughs> one of the John, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Well, thank you. I've really enjoyed the discussion.